Uh, good morning and welcome to everybody to the February 2022 webinar for the Mortgage Quality and Compliance Committee for the California MBA. I'm Susan Malazzo, CEO of the California MBA, and I'm very happy that you could join us today. Um, we uh, um, will get in today's presentation here in a moment, but I wanted to start off today and just remind everybody that there still is an opportunity for a company to be a sponsor for uh, this webinar series. It does happen monthly the fourth Thursday of every month, and uh, we provide our sponsors um, opportunity for um, some marketing and all of our um, social media posts that we need to promote, um, the, promote the webinars, as well as on our website for the recordings of all of our webinars, and we invite you to participate and um, do a little 30-second commercial at the start of each of our sessions. So if you're interested, uh, contact sponsor at CMBA, and we'll be happy to talk with you about that benefit. Uh, getting into today's presentation, uh, I would like to turn it over to Paula Lieber, who is VP of Compliance and Licensing at CMG Financial. Paula, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Susan. So first, we'll start off with a couple deadline reminders for all of us licensee lenders out there. The CRMLA report is due March 1st. The CFL annual report is due March 15th. Of course, HUMDA is due March 1st. I hope you're all done already. <laughs> and if you're not a HUMDA reporter, don't forget California has its own Holden Act report. If you do not file HUMDA with the government, then you need to do that report by March 31st. Plenty of reports for our regulators. Uh, so next, Pat, would you please do our legislative update? I will, thank you. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today um, is uh, a few of the bills that have just been introduced that I think will be of interest to the membership. Um, just to give you a sense, we had the bill deadline uh, for, for introduction uh, on Friday, last Friday. So we had about a thousand bills introduced just last week. So we're literally sifting through all of these bills. And uh, today we're going to talk about four very, very briefly because we're still essentially reviewing them. First bill is AB 2170. I'm told that this is sponsored by the California Association of Realtors. And I think it's it's part of their effort to um, deal with situations where you have a, a sophisticated corporate entities that are purchasing large volumes of properties, uh, residential one to four properties, and then renting them out uh, or selling them separately. Um, and what this bill would do, it, was, it would affect any um, residential one to four dwelling that is owned by a federal government sponsored enterprise. So if they acquire it in a foreclosure, um, and they wanted to sell it, they would have to, within the first 30 days of the sale, <clears throat> only consider offers from prospective owner occupants. Um, uh, others could put in bids for the property, but they couldn't consider uh, these bids um, until 30 days after uh, the sale begins. So it's, it's kind of designed to um, allow for prospective owner occupiers to be able to get the first uh, take at, at buying these properties. So um, that's AB 2170. Um, next bill is uh, SB 975. <clears throat> this is a successor to a bill that um, we opposed last year that died, SB 373. Um, so uh, what this bill does is it deals with um, alleged victims of uh, coerced debt or economic abuse and tries to provide them with some uh, assistance. Last year's version of it um, really stacked stack the deck against creditors when these allegations are made. You know, as an example, all it would take is, uh, under last year's bill, a written statement from an attorney or from a counselor that um, a person was the victim of economic abuse and essentially that would be determined as um, presumptive evidence that the person actually was the victim of that abuse. This year's version is I think much fairer. It allows for the um, alleged victim to file a cross complaint against a creditor um, where they uh, allege that they are, are the victim of course debt, but then it allows the court to determine by preponderance of evidence whether that's accurate or not. 
Um, so at least in our initial review, it seems like a much fairer process doesn't stack the deck immediately against creditors. But we're taking a look at it because it would affect mortgage debt. It affects all kinds of debt, both secured and unsecured. Um, next bill is SB 1176. I think this is going to get a lot of attention from our membership. Um, this bill would uh, put in place in California state CRA. It would impact um, residential mortgage lender licensees. It would impact state chartered banks and state chartered credit unions. And then oddly, it would also impact money transmitters. Um, this bill is authored by the chair of the Senate Banking Committee, and it's modeled after uh, a bill that passed in Illinois last year um, that would uh, have many of the same types of requirements. I think SB 1176 goes actually further then um, the Illinois bill, um, as an example, you would have to um, uh, report on diversity and try to establish diversity within a board of uh, impacted entity. Uh, so not just with respect to loans, et cetera. Um, and it would put in place a $100,000 uh, $100, penalty um, uh, for violations of the act. So we're reviewing this bill as we speak, um, but my, my um, strong uh, belief is that it's going to be of great concern for mortgage lenders in California. And then a uh, final bill I wanted to mention is SB 1323. Um, this bill would affect uh, foreclosure sales, and um, you'd have to actually hire a retailer to list the property. And um, the way it looks like it, it's set, you'd have to um, list the property for uh, at least 120 days um, before you can uh, go forward with the foreclosure sale. Um, so it's gonna, it's gonna create all kinds of, of issues with respect to for potential foreclosure sales. Not sure why you would have to have a realtor to actually list these. Um, and then it would require a, a neutral third party appraiser to appraise the property and you'd have to provide that information with respect to the NOS. So lots of details yet in, uh, to um, be reviewed in this bill, but it, very first um, uh, analysis is it looks like it's gonna be really problematic for NOSs. Um, that's it as far as issues that I wanted to highlight, but like I said, we have, um, many more bills that we're reviewing and we'll uh, provide updates in the next call. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, the SB 1176 is vital, definitely, like you said. We in the industry are going to need to help with that. We will need to be a part of going to um, our own senators, our, our own political leaders, and helping to explain that we do uh, fulfill those requirements without them needing to pass that bill. So um, keep an eye out for ways that you can help the CMBA with this um, with this bill. Um, so we are very excited today. Uh, we Wait, are looking. Oh, time out! Time out! Oh, yes. I wanted I wanted to ask Michael <clears throat> there with his NASCAR headset on. <laughs> um, you haven't said much, Michael, but I I wanted to like a, a 60 second update on what you are seeing clients doing out there. Uh, just a quick snippet of, of what are the big concerns you're seeing, uh, seeing in the trenches? Uh, let's see. Well, number one is margin compression. Um, how we're going to, how clients are going to handle that. I think fair lending is probably a big concern for lenders. Um, if they're servicing, um, some of the servicing regulations that went into effect last year, and if they have a subservicer, if those subservicers are uh, meeting those requirements. But I, I think the biggest concern is probably uh, mar margin compression and volume and right sizing if they need to. And I see more companies starting to look at offshore solutions and um, figuring out how they can reduce their costs or automate uh, more of the process. Thank you. Yeah. Three, three, three yeah. out there in front of the bus. Not yeah, that's the, fine. Front, yeah. Front and I have these great headsets. I can hear everything with it. There you go. <laughs> All right, Paula, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Michael, you definitely got put on the spot, but well done. Yeah. You were, I think you were ready for that. <laughs> he, he took all my speed. He took my presentation away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so, of course, let me first introduce Rob. He's very well known in the industry. We're thrilled to have him on our webinar today. Uh, he has a wide range of experience in risk management and with many lenders, including my own CMG Financial, which is exciting to see. And of course, Rob is renowned for his daily blog that we wake up to so that we can keep up to date on current mortgage events. So all of us compliance folks need some help on what's going on in the industry, what the economic forecast is, and we would love to hear from you. So first, today, obviously Ukraine is very big in the news. Um, what do you see the impact of Ukraine for on rates and us lenders? Well, uh, you, I, I learned early on, Paula, that that bad news is good news for interest rates. So we're seeing an example of it this week with the invasion of Ukraine. And of course, Russia is not saying it's an invasion, but you know, be that as it may, the the bad news is that Ukraine is being invaded. The good news is that it has caused a flight to quality, uh, a sudden flight to quality. Now let's let's take a step back. We are coming out of a couple of years of a pandemic. Uh, I hope that's behind us, dealing with COVID and so forth. And a lot of people. Uh, we a lot of people thought that 2020 would see an increase in rate. Rates were low, uh, but not as low as they got. But oh my gosh, 2020 uh, rates are going to go up. Sure enough, everybody was wrong. At least I should say all the experts were wrong, and rates instead went down because of the pandemic and because of everybody quarantining and so forth. We went into 2021, rates were still good, and rates continued to be good for most of 2020 and 2021. And then as 2021 was coming to an end, rates started to creep up. We had this kind of post-pandemic thinking that uh, the worst was behind us. You had families who hadn't been to Disneyland in a couple of years. You had people wanting to go out to eat. You had people wanting to buy cars. You had people wanting to buy, buy, buy. And so the economic engine of the United States and around the world started to pick up a little bit of steam. So we hit New Year's and suddenly inflation kicks in, uh, being caused by this pent up economic demand. Well, uh, lo and behold, we go, in the 20, uh, we go into 2022, January and February with this fear of inflation. Now, the Federal Reserve, of course, one of their missions is to help stabilize the U.S. economy. And they felt that going out and engaging in, quote, quantitative easing during 2020 and 2021 would help stabilize the economy. And in fact, it did. They were going out and buying mortgage-backed securities. They were buying treasuries. But as 2021 wrapped up, the economics folks out there and the analysts and the traders said, huh, this economy runs the risk of overheating. We think that the Fed will stop buying these securities pretty soon. Not only that, but they will start raising the overnight Fed funds rate target or the discount rate. And sure enough, that's what's come to pass. So inflation picked up. We had uh, the Fed coming out basically saying, yeah, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna raise rates. We're gonna stop buying these securities. That'll push prices down, rates higher. The higher rates will serve to dampen the economy, all right? Because uh, if, uh, if Paula, you own a, uh, a movie theater and the movie theater is doing well, and you're thinking about opening up a movie theater across, the across town, you might get a small business loan. Let's say small business rates are 2%, so it pencils out to open up that new theater for you. If small business loan rates go to 5% or 6%, it may not pencil out, so you may not open up that theater, in which case it serves to dampen things a little bit. Well, that's going on around the nation, around the world, that as rates go up, companies, are companies tend to expand less. Uh, people tend to maybe not use their credit cards as much because credit, cards are rate, credit card rates are relatively high, and so it tends to dampen the economy. So we get into Feb January and February, 
COVID behind us, pandemic is improving, inflation is picking up, the Fed has made its path clear. Well, suddenly Ukraine starts creeping into the headlines. So everybody looks at their world maps because you know conflict is a great way to, to learn world geography, figure out where Ukraine is and what's going on there. And then this week, all of the talk about an invasion from Russia, from the United States, from Europe and so forth has come to fruition. We basically have an invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia. Everybody scrambles to figure out exactly what that means and the extent of it. At the same time, we see this week the traditional flight to quality. And when people get spooked, whether it's an invasion of a, another country or North Korea firing off a missile uh, you know, over the Sea of Japan, whatever it might be, those geopolitical events cause people to be nervous. They cause money managers to be nervous, investors to be nervous, and so forth. So we get a flight to quality. So people start putting their money into less risky assets. So generally speaking, that's away from the stock market. So Paula, uh, you know, I'm sorry if you have a 401k that's invested in a lot of App Amazon and Apple stock or IBM or Exxon, well, maybe not Exxon, but you know, the stock market has really taken it on the chin this week. Uh, on the good news side of things is that bonds, bond prices have rallied, rates have dropped. So we find that uh, the invasion of Ukraine has actually helped the bond market, helped rates. Now, the question is, how long is this going to last? There are economic sanctions that have been put into place against Russia. Uh, Putin has his view of view of the world, view of things, view of his national security. So this could grind on for a while. But up until I would say yesterday, the the general thinking was that we've been talking about this for so long. It's already priced into the market. We found out yesterday and today it's not so much priced into the market. Got a nice rally. The question is, where where do we go from here? Does it have really a long-term lasting impact on rates and on the bond market and on the stock market, or is it kind of a one-shot deal and we then resume our our increase in rates throughout 2022? So that's kind of the thinking about Ukraine. It was talked about for so long. Here it is. The effect may be muted unless it has a long-term impact on the world economy. Uh, but I don't see rates going back to where they were during the worst of the pandemic. In general, rates are supposed to continue moving higher uh, throughout 2022. Uh, hopefully everyone got their refinances done back in 2020. <laughs> yeah, I would, say, I would say this industry has been very good about refinancing millions and millions of borrowers into sub 3% mortgages, whether those are 30 year loans or 15 year loans or adjustable rate loans, I would say that a lot of borrowers out there are in great shape in terms of interest rates. Yeah, definitely. Um, now are lenders even paying attention to rates? Well, that's a good question. Um, they are to some extent. But when I travel around the nation, and for example, last week I was in Chicago and Cleveland, today I'm in uh, beautiful uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, where there's an ice storm. Uh, the, the lenders that I'm talking to have an eye on interest rates. They know why interest rates are supposed to go up. They know why they came down yesterday and today. They have a sense of what's going on out there. They also have a sense, as uh, Michael talked about, of the diminishing margins and the diminishing volume. And so from a lender's perspective, we all knew that rates wouldn't stay that low forever. And so we have a situation where rates are supposed to go up. Okay, they're supposed to go up. Now, maybe the Fed steps on the brakes too hard, causes a recession, rates come back down. I don't personally, uh, you know, hold that view. I think the Fed is a little more intelligent than that. But that said, <clears throat> with volume supposed to decrease, to your point, so many people have sub 3% loans. They're, they may not be looking at a rate and term anytime soon. With rates moving higher, lenders know that rates are going to go higher, expect rates to go higher. 
the question comes back to your question, do they even care? They care, but the good lenders that I'm seeing out there are really focused on what are we going to do now? You know, keeping their knees bent for any sports, for any athletes on the call here. You know, you're supposed to keep your knees bent when you're playing a sport. So lenders are looking at becoming more efficient, lowering costs. All the while, they have to keep an eye on compliance and QC because of the regulatory environment, uh, which I think we're going to talk about here in a little bit, and compliance uh, environment, you can't like cut the QC department. You can't cut the compliance department. You have to be smart about using the compliance tools that you have out there. MQMR, for example, has, has a, a, a range of interesting things out there that lenders should take a look at. I know this isn't necessarily an ad for MQMR, but they do have good products. And what companies are doing are saying, they're saying, we're not going to turn compliance or QC over to, you know, Edna, our, our, you know, underwriter that we've had for 30 years, she can take care of compliance, she can take care of QC, Ed, Edna will take care of it all. Lenders are having to be very smart about compliance and about QC, about making sure that their loan originators aren't saying things on social media that they shouldn't say, making sure that they know about recent developments in fair lending, make sure that they know what the CFPB is up to. And I would say that that even though lenders have an eye on rates, they know that margins are have compressed, they know that volumes are supposed to diminish, but they have to keep up certain parts of their business. Otherwise, <clears throat> they can get into a lot of trouble that'll cost them much more money than any kind of QC and compliance department. So they are paying attention to it. They've shifted the discussion from rate and term refis to more cash out refis or purchase business. What kind of discussion do we have to have with loan officers who are used to going out and getting refis versus uh, going out and getting purchase business? So these discussions are going on with sales management teams and out there in branches. How are we going to get this purchase business? And what kind of products do we have to offer? And uh, all the while with an eye on compliance and, and QC. Yeah, thank you. And speaking of the purchase market, I mean, that's definitely something we lenders are going to rely on to keep in the black. What are you hearing out there in your travels? Well, the big the big issue continues to be inventory or lack thereof. Everywhere I go, there, uh, I should say nowhere I go, there are uh, for sale signs. It seems like inventory is a real issue. The, the baby boomers are holding on to their houses and potentially buying second homes and vacation places like Florida or the Gulf Coast. Southern California, even the, uh, the 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 other generations following them, you know, kids, people in their 20s and 30s and 40s who want to own a home, and they either have bought a home recently, once again with rates below three percent, or they want to own a home. Uh, they're getting married, they're buying, you know, getting a dog, they're having kids, and so forth. They're tired of that apartment living. So demographically, you have that going on. On top of that. You have the next generation coming up, which at some point will want to own homes. You've got people getting divorced who need to buy homes, want to buy homes, need housing. And so you have all this going on out there. And on the supply side, like I said, baby boomers are not selling their houses. In fact, they're buying vacation homes. You have builders who for years now haven't been building enough homes to satisfy the demand for new housing. You have affordable housing mandates coming down from Washington, D.C. You have builders saying, well, I don't even know how to spell affordable. Uh, I'd rather build a, a McMansion on this two-acre parcel than, you know, eight units that all the neighbors are going to complain about. And so you've got a lot of cross currents out there in terms of, of the housing market and the purchase business and so forth. So I think lenders are, have been very good so far about switching the conversation to a purchase business. They've dusted off their Rolodexes. They're calling real estate agents who can't believe all the attention they're getting these days, even though there aren't enough listings to go around. Um, and you have products that companies are designing or are uh, implementing, rolling out to help that purchase business in terms of down payment assistance programs, bond programs, uh, high loan to value programs, and so forth. So 
I think the lending environment has changed, has changed, will continue to change through the year with more of a focus on the purchase business. If there is inventory out there on away from the rate and term refis, because a lot of those have been done, but there's still millions of potential rate and term refis out there. So we can't disregard those entirely, but certainly the focus has shifted toward trying to go out and get that purchase business. Uh, and I'll finish up with a glimpse into the M&A world because I know some companies want to sell their 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 businesses. You know, you've got owners in their 60s or 70s, they want to retire. <clears throat> when you are looking at a potential acquisition, the cop the topic which is almost near the top is what was your percentage of refis in 2021 and in 2020? So am I buying a refi shop or am I buying a purchase shop? And if it was mostly refis, what have you done since then? to change your product mix. So it, it matters all the way from loan officers all the way up to mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and in terms of, of stock prices for the publicly held lenders out there, what was their percentage of business of refis in recent years and how are they going to react to the purchase business? So it's definitely a topic of conversation out there uh, uh, around the nation. Thank you. And thank you so much for explaining it in such an easy way to understand for us, uh, you know, compliance folks, instead of making it a very technical economic conversation about bond prices. <laughs> no worries. That was perfect. Um, now, while the loan officers are, yeah, brushing off those roller decks um, and contacting their real estate agents, they need to be very careful about RESPA and what our regulators going to be looking at. What is the CFPB looking at? we you know need to continue to be careful so i'm very glad with that we have Jonice here to talk to us about what the cfpb is looking at um but really quickly for me to introduce uh Jonice gray tucker is a partner at buckley's dc office and a member of the firm's partner board a substantial portion of her practice involves government examination matters investigations and enforcement actions and she's recognized as a leading lawyer in the area of financial services regulation, where she's been described as whip smart, a tenacious litigator that helps navigate the labyrinth of regulatory agencies. I love the de description. Um, Jonice, please take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction uh, there. I don't know if it's all justified um, or not. Um, I, I'm going to go. There's so much to talk about here. I'm going to go through a lot of this very quickly. I'm going to try to hit um, a lot of the highlights about where we're what we're dealing with with this administration. Um, I'm going to give a, a, a little bit of background on kind of why we're dealing with this in this administration. And then as I go through, I'll do as much as I can to give compliance tips. Um, and I am going to apologize in advance. Um, this is not going to go down easy and I will be sending Pepto to those who want it. You can put it in the chat and I can give that to you afterwards. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so where are we? Uh, um, huge, um, this could be called CFPB and beyond and the rest of them, um, because I am going to touch on, on the rest of them. Um, big trends in the Biden administration, huge federal focus on consumer protection writ large, due in part to um, a, a perception, um, which is not entirely inaccurate, that there was a big pullback uh, on these issues during the Trump administration. Within that focus on consumer protection, very acute focus on issues related to racial equity and social justice. This is top down from the administration. Um, a function of m many things, um, including the p political um, unrest in this country um, with respect to um, George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey, um, outsized impact of the pandemic on certain minority communities, and just um, certain market forces, including uh, the fact that there are certain minority communities, including specifically African Americans, that never came back from the recession, did not come back. So you layer on a pandemic, acute focus. Um, in the Biden administration, um, we see these issues laced through um, at all of the agencies and their agendas, as well as in the backgrounds of those that have got significant appointments. Um, there are other players in this mix. A lot of focus on these issues from Capitol Hill, um, with the Democrats obviously controlling, at least for right now, um, a bunch of key committees. We've got states focusing on these issues, um, collaborating with the federal government. 
Um, and we've got also forces from consumer advocates and from the media. Um, and so this is kind of a gigantic circle where folks are feeding off of each other and um, driving, driving agendas. Um, CFPB, obviously huge for this audience. Um, I want to mention a couple others, though. HUD. HUD has woken up, and they are off to the races. I'm going to talk about that in, in a few minutes. A um, lot of activity from them right now. Uh, uh, Department of Justice um, has the ability not to audit you all or examine, but they have the ability to investigate, and they are. Um, many state regulators also focused on these issues. And then we've got prudential banking regulators also in the mix, very, very active. So if we move to the CFPB, here's where we sit. We have a new director, Rohit Chopra, um, he, Director Chopra was at the CFPB uh, in days gone by as the student loan ombudsman, went on to um, some other work, including becoming a, a FTC commissioner for quite some, some time, and now he's back at the Bureau um, as the director. He is um, a relatively aggressive guy. Um, he was very aggressive, um, and some might say a little bit divisive, as a, a FTC commissioner, but he had several other commissioners to um, balance him out. Now he is a, a single director. Um, he's made some notable appointments, um, including a new head of enforcement. Um, his name is Eric Halperin. Um, Eric was um, at the Department of Justice, um, helped stand up the housing section of the Department of Justice in the early portion of the, uh, the second date of the, uh, decade of the 2000s. Um, heavy, heavy fair lending focus um, and background. Eric also was at um, the Center for Responsible Lending, for those of you who know that outfit, um, quite activist, uh, very aggressive, very smart guy, balanced, but he's got an agenda. The agency um, went down on staffing um, at the Bureau during the Trump administration, um, both uh, departures um, and um, attrition, uh, you know, in part driven by, by the administration. Positions eliminated and positions never never filled. Um, the agency is on a hiring spree um, at this point. They have been for about a year. Um, and so that that basically means um, huge uptick in bodies over there to do work and focus on us. Um, with respect to the top three trends that I see from the Bureau, the um, unfortunate part about that is that the, the two of those top three matter very much, and this is just my, my worldview um, for this audience. Um, so deposits, y'all don't have to worry about that unless you're lenders that engage in other, other things, um, but consumer mortgage and fair lending, like that's my top three list. Um, and so mortgage writ large and fair lending. On consumer mortgage, we are talking about looking at the entire life cycle of uh, products and services, everything from initial outreach I'm going to get into redlining in a second, um, all the way through pricing, underwriting, and potentially servicing. Um, we are seeing a return to the use of UDAP as a catch-all theory. So during the Trump administration, what we saw from the Bureau was a real focus, um, one, on not using the enforcement tool, and two, backing away from let's go make some new law because we don't like something and call that a UDAP. Um, in the Trump administration, folks were very focused on technical, um, and they could be significant, but violations of black letter law and not making new law regulation by enforcement through the use of UDAP. All bets are off um, on, on that. Um, UDAP is back in style and um, I, we are gonna see um, sort of a reversal and more of what we saw in the Obama administration, which is use of UDAP to, to catch um, things that the Bureau may not like. As I mentioned, fair lending is a particularized area of focus. Um, during the Trump administration, um, there was a huge pullback in, in fair lending, um, but there was continued activity where there was disparate treatment. Um, so think closer to um, intentional discrimination, um, whether overt or proven by comparative evidence. We're back to disparate impact. It's back, y'all. Nobody should be surprised about that. Um, and it is creeping into a variety of theories. So again, just a reminder, as we're thinking about fair lending to focus on both treatment, you know, heaven help us if it should be going on in an organization, but also back to focusing on um, uh, impact. The pandemic. So the bureau, the bureau said, you know, latitude for lenders. There's going to be leeway. 
we're, you know, we're all trying to react and do the right thing, prioritized assessments. Some of you may have gone through them. That's not really a gotcha move. It's um, we're here to we're here to to, to help. Not 100 percent um, accurate anymore. Um, so pandemic related measures um, that have been undertaken um, are being scrutinized. Um, things like compliance with CARES, CARES Act, uh, but also other uh, other things that have gone on um, that it, that are flowing from prioritized assessments. Um, and so pandemic measures, and I'll tick off a few to consider in a little bit, um, probably deserve some attention um, inside of organizations because a lot was done on the fly uh, with good intentions, but it could have consequences we didn't intend. Um, innovation. Huge runway for this in the Trump administration. We had, you know, um, no action letter process, really get off to the races, um, you know, various um, sandboxes and trial programs, um, many of them out of the Bureau's Office of Innovation. I would say ground to a halt. Um, pretty much a lot of folks that were moving through the process um, are in holding patterns. Um, and I think this administration beyond the Bureau realizes that innovation um, it can provide a lot of access, um, but there is uh, an increasing level of um, scrutiny about what happens if the machine goes awry um, and has unintended consequences on those who are unsophisticated, vulnerable, in a protected class, um, whatever uh, the case may be. This was an issue for Rohit Chopra when he was a commissioner at the FTC. He has ported that over um, to the CFPB and um, huge issue uh, for him now, um, writ, writ large, I'll give a couple examples. Um, compliance personnel, we like to stay in supervision. Supervision is good. We want to work with our regulators. Um, we have seen a rebalancing of the toolkit. Um, and that rebalancing means back to a scenario where um, the hammer is being used more, meaning enforcement, and that is matters starting in enforcement, um, as well as matters moving from supervision to enforcement. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we always hope our examiners aren't playing a gotcha game, but do understand that we are dealing with a much more aggressive environment than we had been dealing with um, during the last four years. Redlining um, is a huge, huge issue. I'm gonna start with this as my first kind of hot topic. Very notable here because while there was a broad pullback on fair lending related issues in the Trump administration, this is a topic that kept going. Why did it keep going? I would speculate because it's a disparate treatment theory. And so what's gonna stick in an administration that wants to back away from disparate impact while well, intent, intent, intentional discrimination sticks? Um, what's important to understand about um, sort of modern day redlining as it may be called at this point though, is that we have moved um, away from the you know cases built on overt evidence. There may be some, um, but these are now heavy statistics cases. Um, so making sure that one is on top of um, their quant is doing appropriate peer analysis with the right peer group in mind. And it's not necessarily the government's methodology of using as peers those who are one half to two times your volume um, in apps or origination. So right analysis with the right peer group, but getting in front of it because um, I, what I am seeing in my practice, and I'm do, dealing with a ton of this, um, is the quant is the driver for the government standing up and paying attention. And then they start paying attention to you either in examinations or investigations. I'm dealing with a lot of both. Um, and then they go looking to see if they can find other evidence um, that there, there may have been intentional red line. There was a time when non-banks um, thought that they would get a pass um, on this. This is not so, non-banks in the audience. Um, beeline for non-depositories um, at, at this point in time. Um, also, if you are in a, a, a niche, some sort of niche that you know really hasn't been a focus for, for the government, you lend to a particular you know, uh, kind of um, subset of, of folks, um, race neutral, you know, gender neutral, but that's that's kind of what it is. Um, all bets are off um, on those who are in, are in a niche also. Um, and um, there's there's a fair amount of looking um, at specialty type uh, type lenders. Um, so 
things to keep in mind, looking at product mix, looking at what's going on in marketing. Um, what do your marketing materials look like? What, what do your models look like in your marketing materials? Um, what's your outreach strategy to diverse communities? Um, where are you marketing? Um, literally, um, huge issue if you have branches, um, where are your branches? Go plot those on a map. And like, if you don't have any in majority minority census tracts, time to stand up, take note, notice and figure it out. Um, may not be opening a new branch, but it may be starting a community outreach center and those MLOs are canvassing. Um, so all of those things, very, very important. Um, I took so long on redlining because it is the number one issue right now. It's, you know, kind of set the world on fire. Um, with respect to other issues, pricing and underwriting. Um, back in style, particularly pricing. Um, CFPB uh, has got a horizontal review um, going on. It's been going on about a year now. Uh, which, which is principally focused on pricing exceptions, um, but they've swept across the industry and these are these 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 matters are kind of moving along. Our sleepy little friends at HUD, they've got a horizontal set of investigations going on. Um, and um, the the letters are flying. Um, and they are focused um, principally on pricing disparities. And it, I mean this is let, letter after letter after letter. Um, they have crunched numbers. And um, those that had significant pricing disparities, um, notwithstanding there would be limitations in building a regression model if you don't know the proper controls, um, but be line there, so, so be aware. Um, what the takeaway on that um, means is for both pricing and underwriting, know your numbers, just like with redlining. Um, make sure your regression models um, are appropriately calibrated to your institution. Um, one football that I've seen quite a lot in fair lending is kind of plain vanilla, vanilla analysis being used. It spits out a problem. It's not a real problem. But now you've got data sitting in the company's files that looks like there is a problem. And the regulator comes on by and says, why isn't this a problem? And then the proper deeper analysis is done. And there's an explanation. But the, the regulator then says, but why is that not in the file? Um, if that were the real explanation, and then there's more explaining to do. Another um, critical footfall is where file review needs to be done um, to get deeper, to try to explain um, disparities that may be going on. Companies so busy, not able to finish the file review, finish file reviews, um, and then take appropriate action. Exceptions, another huge, huge issue, um, making sure that there's um, very well-defined policies and procedures, that there's training, um, that there is um, documentation, documentation, documentation of why an exception has been given um, because the ex post facto explanation of what happened here is not cutting it. Um, and this is actually not just the Bureau, this is across agencies. Um, and then doing the periodic monitoring and testing. Another thing to consider is the degree to which the senior most management and the board, the board of directors, have visibility into pricing exception policies. It appears that we are moving towards an expectation, I do, I do not think it's fair, um, that at the highest level of governance that there is visibility um, and some level of oversight with respect to exceptions. Um, I think it's relatively Credible that somebody would think that the board would be down in the weeds in these issues, um, but this is more than a blip. Um, so I, thinking about those issues as well, extremely um, important. Uh, digital redlining, um, what do I mean by that? Um, huge issue, particularly for companies that are using alternative data points, um, which can expand access to credit, um, advanced algorithms, and the, the three for algorithms that might be running on AI um, or machine learning. Um, you get these things together and you have a lot of potential to expand access, entire product life cycle, um, from the outreach at the marketing stage to a more appropriate, um, you know, extension credit, um, to more appropriate pricing to even servicing. 
Um, but a lot of skepticism um, uh, here from regulators. Um, this is a bugaboo for um, Director Topra. It was when he was back at the FTC, um, and it is now a, a, a bugaboo at the CFPB, but he has friends. Um, there is now um, a joint um, redlining initiative um, that includes a focus on digital um, amongst the Department of Justice, the CFPB, and the OCC. Um, and I can, that was announced in October, um, it is real. Um, and so for those that are using um, advanced algorithms, for those that are using AI, um, for those that are using alternative data points at certain places to try to expand marketing or access, um, I would say this is an area where most companies are behind. They didn't see it coming. They're not testing for these issues. Um, and this is a place like, you know, kind of highlight, bold, underscore, um, start thinking about getting compliance management um, around, around these, uh, the, these areas. Um, I mentioned a few other things, and then I, I, I'm probably getting um, close to being out, out of time here. Fees. Um, so the Bureau has re released a very inflammatory press release and um, companion RFI on, quote, junk fees. I don't agree that all of them are junk, um, but they're looking at this. And so um, I would suggest that you, as compliance professionals, um, take a hard look um, at fees. And in the mortgage context, those that have been called out in the RFI include closing costs, um, that are perceived as inflated or padded um, uh, or insufficient, um, justified based on competition, um, looking at uh, um, where title insurance is, um, fees in servicing um, for making payments by phone, um, online, uh, through bill pay service, and also delinquency related fees. Um, so take a, a hard look at the fees, um, pretty important. Um, that's reflected in the RFI. And I'll also note that um, in, in supervisory highlights for those who may read those, um, there, there was a note in the fall 2021 supervisory highlights um, about the dovetails with this issue. Um, and the particularized focus was on, um, as to this institution, it's emblematic, I think, of what we're seeing. Um, there are allegedly being charges to consumers that um, the actual cost and what was charged to the, the consumer um, it was pretty wide delta without an explanation. Um, in this context, they were focused on um, BPOs and, um, and inspection fees. Um, so we're talking about servicing, but still looking at the disparity, if there is one, between actual cost of service and then what's, what's, what's charged to the borrower, and particularly those that are in a state of um, delinquency, um, because they can likely least afford it. Uh, appra appraisal bias, we could have a whole session on. Um, if you are not focused on these issues, time to get focused. Um, and this is another top down from the Biden administration focus um, on appraisals. There is an interagency task force um, uh, at the federal level that's looking at these issues and going to make recommendations. We've also had some other significant um, issues. There was a major um, lender that for better or worse entered into a um, consent order with, with uh, HUD. Um, around these issues based on a borrower allegation um, that, that, that got a lot of media attention. Um, and there was a mortgagee letter um, relatively recently as well, reaffirming that the, the FHA does apply to appraisals. Uh, and then just yesterday, to bring together all of our issues, um, the CFPB sent out a bulletin um, that focused on the combination of algorithmic bias and appraisals. Um, and really zeroed in on um, how and whether um, models could be driving under or overvaluation of properties. Um, and so we've got now the intersection of, the, of innovation and fair lending and appraisals, all in one neat and tidy package. If you are not looking, I haven't seen that, 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 um, that missive, I would, I would suggest that you have a, a, a look at it, um, relatively informative. Um, with respect to um, sort of future state of where the Bureau may go on these issues. Um, I will round this out with a couple of notes on uh, in the servicing front. Um, loss mitigation, unsurprising, 
um, CFPB really focused on um, these kinds of issues, and it's like back back to the future um, in terms of what they have been focused on. Um, they're looking at timing um, of applications against decisioning. Um, one would think maybe even if there was a slip, hey, we're in a pandemic. No. Um, so uh, so you know, making sure you're tight on your 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 timing um, per uh, Reg X. Um, they are looking at dual tracking. Um, even when that dual tracking, you know, may have happened because of a, a blip, um, but like looking at those um, those issues, looking at issues related to termination of PMI um, when the threshold is hit to terminate, um, and whether or not that's been done and done timely, um, and then also looking at CARES Act um, and forbearances and whether or what kinds of and whether um, fees were charged. Um, late fees, default related fees, et cetera, when they should not have been charged. So um, those are all issues in 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 loss mitigation um, that are going to get a lot of attention. Um, last thing I will mention, um, which itself also could be its own webinar, um, is fair servicing. By fair servicing, I mean um, the concept of um, folks not getting an unfair shake um, in servicing because of membership in a protected class. Um, this issue caught fire right after um, the recession and um, really many of us thought this was going to take off. There's a lot of attention on this. And then when we got down and looked at these issues, you know, the, the disparities weren't um, uh, there um, for those who were testing. I'm not sure that's going to be the case um, now for a whole host of, of reasons. So I would say doubling down um, to make sure that um, fairness and servicing is going on. Um, what kinds of things, you know, to look at? Looking at collections, um, including the ability to communicate with disabled consumers or those who have limited English proficiency, um, which can be a proxy for membership in a, a protected class. Looking at loss mitigation, um, how hardship programs are being made known, um, discretion in offering options, um, disparities in the kind of loss mitigation that's being provided. Um, a discretion issue is really tricky here too because you know everybody wants a house but not everybody necessarily wants or needs to stay in that house once in default um, and in addition what brought them there is often in individualized so some level of discretion is needed. Um, regulators don't like discretion we all know this but some level of flexibility is needed but basically cabining it um, to the degree that it can be to make sure, again, particularly in loss met, um, that folks are offered equal equal um, opportunity to, uh, to, to, to get a workout. Fee waivers, that's another one. Um, what latitude is provided around fee waivers? When's it done? Um, and what's the documentation? Um, here's how this can, can get to be a tricky situation. It is well known. Certain populations of folks are likely to advocate for themselves and maybe others aren't, including women and certain people in protected classes, those who may be immigrants. And so um, when you go look at fee waiver, you know, a data, you may see that, well, gosh, yeah, um, these borrowers over here have all, they, they get their fee waivers and these don't tend to, they never even asked. So looking at those kinds of issues. Um, and then, um, you know, as we move into an era where inevitably there are going to be this, you know, in, in some measure, you know, um, there's going to be a downflow, hopefully not a bust um, on this, this, you know, housing market. What are we looking at um, with respect to foreclosures um, and um, uh, REO management? And I think a lot of us thought, like, aren't we done with this? Like, you know, all of these cases that were about like differential management of REO and upkeep and that kind of kind of thing. No, actually not. Um, even a big, a big resolution with the GSE just two weeks ago around this. These are the cases that have gone on for like a decade. And here we are back again. So um, whole life cycle servicing is probably what needs to be looked at. Um, and um, with that, I have probably taken up more time than I should have. Um, I will turn it back um, to you all. Thank you so much, Jonice. That was uh, an amazing overview. I definitely need my Pepto-Bismol. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but right. that, the job security for those of us in compliance in QC, clearly 
we are definitely needed. There's a lot of focus on, on areas that we are responsible for. Um, so thank you so much, Rob and Jonis, um, for all that information. And everyone, we've got some great webinars coming up this year, speaking of fair lending and fair servicing. That is our next two months of webinars. So please stay tuned and attend those webinars. This committee is definitely here to help you um, with all of our responsibilities, everything that we need to work on and that um, Rob and Jonice have been telling us about today. Um, Susan, do we have um, some questions? Yeah, there's one. If you, uh, if you have a, a question, you can post for either of our presenters, you can post those in the Q&A dialogue box and um, we will be moderating those now. So I do have one question, it's for Janice. Do you have any insight on the CFPP's position on name-only searches as they relate to current OFAC name-only searches by the GSEs? For example, Ramirez versus TransUnion. Yeah, um, I don't have any inside baseball uh, on that. If I if I had it, um, I, I sort of know what's in the public domain. Um, but no, unfortunately, I'm sorry for whoever asked that question. I don't I don't have any inside information on um, you know nuances of their perspective on that issue. Okay. Okay, so again, if you if you have any questions, uh, you are welcome and invited to pose those in the Q and A, uh, the questions dialogue box. Uh, but I'll just note uh, while we're seeing if there's any other questions that are coming in, as Paula had mentioned, uh, you can mark your calendars for next month. Our March um, topic will be avoiding fair lending pitfalls, and we'll be featuring Marty Allred with American Pacific Mortgage and Daniel Johnson with cross-check compliance. So um, if you're on our mailing list and received um, the registration for today's uh, presentation, um, you'll be receiving that as well. If you received the invitation for today's presentation through someone else or saw it online and you'd like to be added to our list, uh, go ahead and email us at membership at cmba.com and ask to be added to the MQAC uh, email distribution list. I think that concludes today's presentation. Rob, Janice, thank you so much for participating and for the great content that you provided. Uh, Paula and Michael, great job as always, and we'll see everybody next month. Thanks, everyone.